Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Richard Ryan, and I am Senior Washington Correspondent for the Detroit News and President of the National Press Club. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, and those of you who are watching on C-SPAN or listening to the program on National Public Television or radio. The video archive of today's luncheon is provided by Connect Live and is available through the National Press Club website at press.org. National Press Club luncheons are also carried live by many sites on the World Wide Web. Press Club members may also access transcripts of our luncheons at our website, and non-members may purchase transcripts, audio, and videotapes by calling 1-888-343-1940. Before introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of some upcoming speakers. On Friday, May 11th, William Gates Sr., co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, will discuss his opposition to eliminating the state tax. And on Tuesday, May 15th, James P. Hoffa, General President of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, will discuss the state of his union. And on Wednesday, May 16th, Edward Whitaker, Chairman and CEO of SBC Communications Incorporated, will discuss full and fair competition in the broadband marketplace. If you have any questions for our speaker, please write them on the cards provided at your table and pass them up to me. But please make sure to write legibly or I'll never be able to ask the question. And I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. Please hold your applause until all head table guests are introduced. From your right and my left, John Cosgrove, communications consultant and senior past president of the National Press Club. John Edward Hurley, president of the Confederate Memorial Association. Steve Thoma of Knight Ritter Newspapers. Uh, Steve was awarded the Aldo Beckman Award by the White House Press Correspondents last Saturday for his coverage of the presidential campaign. Haya El Nasser, reporter, USA Today. Bill Hart, chairman of the board, National Trust for Historic Preservation. Julia Moe, the wife of our speaker. Frank Alkerfer. <laughs> Frank Alkerfer, chairman of the club's speakers committee and a former president of the National Press Club. Speaking, skipping over our speaker for a moment, Al Isley, editor of The Hill, a former colleague of our speaker on Vice President Mondale's staff, and the committee, Speaker's Committee member who organized today's luncheon. Thank you, Al. Linda Wheeler, The Washington Post. Kevin Diaz, Minneapolis Star Tribune. Ed Felker, Small Newspapers, Rochester, Minnesota, Post Bulletin. Michael Marlowe, producer, White House Chronicles television program. And Gil Klein, Media General News Service, and a former president of the National Press Club. As a lifelong student of American history, politics, and government, Richard Moe won his own place in the history books in 1984 when former Vice President Walter Mondale became the Democratic presidential nominee. Mr. Moe, who had been Mr. Mondale's administrative assistant in the Senate and his chief of staff in the White House, was asked by his former boss what he could do to defeat President Reagan. Well, Mr. President, Mr. Moe replied, why don't you call for a tax increase? <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> actually, actually, Mr. Moe can't really be blamed for that memorable and perhaps decisive moment at the Democratic National Convention. After President Carter and Vice President Mondale were prematurely retired by Ronald Reagan and the first George Bush in 1980, Mr. Moe returned to the practice of law. But he can be credited with helping Mr. Mondale win the vice presidential lottery as Jimmy Carter's running mate in 1976. He was the aide who advised Mr. Mondale to assure then Governor Carter that as a boy growing up in southern Minnesota, he ate grits for breakfast every day. <laughs> a mere five years after moving to Washington to join Mr. Mondale's staff as administrative assistant, Mr. Moe became chief of staff, 
and the first member of a Vice President's staff to also be a member of the senior White House staff. Mr. Moe practiced law in Washington from 1981 until January of 1993, when he became the seventh president of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. A native of Duluth, Minnesota, Mr. Moe graduated from Williams College in 1969 and soon became a distinguished career, began a distinguished career in public service with key staff positions in local and state government. He also chaired Minnesota's Democratic Farmer Labor Party while finding the time to earn his law degree from the University of Minnesota. Mr. Moe, now 64, is also an accomplished author. In 1993, he wrote a widely praised Civil War history of the famed 1st Minnesota Regiment called The Last Full Measure, The Life and Death of the 1st Minnesota Regiment. Historian James McGregor Burns, who was one of Mr. Moe's teachers at Williams College, compared the book to Tolstoy's War and Peace and Stephen Crane's The Red Badge of Courage. Mr. Moe is also the co-author of Changing Places, Rebuilding Community in the Age of Sprawl, a 1997 study of the causes of urban decline and the use of historic preservation as a tool to revitalize urban communities. As president of the National Trust, Mr. Moe is responsible for leading the largest nonprofit preservation organization in the United States. Chartered by Congress in 1949, the National Trust has more than a quarter million members nationwide, operates six regional offices, and has 20 historic sites. Under his direction, the National Trust has become an outspoken advocate for controlling sprawl and has demonstrated the effectiveness of preservation as a tool for community revitalization. At one time, the overriding interest of the trust was to save historic houses. But under Mr. Moe, its efforts have expanded to include saving neighborhoods, downtowns, small burgs, and at one point, the entire state of Vermont. <laughs> so, so please join me in welcoming Richard Moe to the National Press Club. Thank you, Dick, very much for having me back to the Press Club. It's a great privilege to be here. I knew Dick in an earlier life when we were on several campaign trails together. And uh, I understand you were a wonderful MC at the Gridiron Dinner this year. And we thought we'd do some skits today. If singer. that was a singer, singer. singer. Did, yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> and Al Isley, my old friend from Minnesota, thank you, I think, for uh, inviting me and arranging for this, uh, that, that bu business about the tax increase in 1984. We'll talk about that later, Al. <laughs> but I am delighted to be back here. Uh, I wanted to talk just briefly today about uh, what's going on in some of, some of America's cities. Uh, everybody loves good news, and America's cities have had a good dose of it lately. Employment is up. Urban, <coughs> urban crime rates are down. Construction cranes have sprout sprouted everywhere. And shiny downtown projects, whether new sports arenas or convention centers or museums, have opened a great fanfare in city centers from coast to coast. More important, people are coming back to the cities. New census figures indicate that the great migration to the suburbs, the huge outflow of people and commerce that bled the vitality out of so many urban centers in the decades since World War II, has slowed down. Population actually increased in some cities uh, in the last decade, some cities as widespread as Boston, <coughs> Atlanta, Chicago, and Denver, all of which had seen their populations drop in the previous decade. In short, and at long last, America's cities appear to be making a comeback. <coughs> but it's much too early to claim victory. The good news is still very heavily qualified. To begin with, many cities are still hemorrhaging people. In some places, an overall increase in urban population simply reflects the fact that many suburbs have reached urban density. In cities that have experienced real population growth, much of it is attributable to an enormous influx of immigrants during the decade, which I think is a very good thing and a very positive force for most cities. In short, some cities are doing better, and some cities are doing better than others. But even in the cities that are making progress, Many neighborhoods are still being left far behind. 
What's more, the flight to the, suburb the suburban fringe has not halted. Just look at New York City, for example. While the city itself grew faster than the inner, inner ring suburbs in the 90s, the outer suburbs grew even faster. Finally, the development of once rural uh, land continues at an incredible pace. More than 17,000 square miles of land that was rural in 1990 reached suburban or urban density by last year. 17,000 square miles. A Department of Agriculture official estimates that about 2 million acres of farmland are developed every single year. Uh, in, in the Atlanta area alone, 50 acres of forest are lost every day. Sprawl is still obviously very much alive and well in America. Our cities still have a long way to go before we can proclaim that they're back. And if they're ever going to make it, the federal government has to play a role in the process. Over the years, federal housing and transportation policies have had the effect, whether intended or not, of driving people out of the cities. And in plenty of others, other areas, from tax codes to infrastructure investment to the location of federal offices, the government has contributed heavily to today's urban problems. Now I believe it has a clear duty to play an active role in solving some of those problems. At the very least, our cities deserve a level playing field where federal policy is concerned. Fifty years ago, the federal government began to offer economic inducements to families that wanted to flee to the suburbs. Now it's time to offer the same kinds of inducements, I think, to help people return to or to stay in the cities. Now this does not have to mean creating a whole new set of programs. It can simply mean recognizing what is already working. One of the things that is working is historic preservation. As a growing number of America's cities are being reborn, historic preservation is playing a major role, in, ma in many cases the leading role in the process. That's right, historic preservation. Some may be surprised to hear that. And if so, it's probably because preservation is not what they think it is. Preservation has matured from a passionate, vocal band of outsiders, the proverbial little old ladies in tennis shoes, to an equally dedicated but much more sophisticated national movement that is having a profound effect on the look and livability of America's communities. What's more, the ranks of people who are doing the actual work of preservation today include plenty of public officials and bottom line business leaders who probably would never think of applying the, the label preservationist to themselves. Let me cite a recent USA Today article about what's happening in Chicago. Quote, downtown has seen a renaissance. River North, an area once filled with factories and vacant buildings, is now a hot entertainment district with art galleries and high-rise condos. The South Loop, once the printing district, has new housing developments, restaurants, and tree-lined streets, end quote. Now, the term historic preservation doesn't appear anywhere in that paragraph, but the urban rebirth that it, is, that it describes is exactly what historic preservation has become today. It's no coincidence that Chicago has in Richard Daley, a mayor who understands, probably better than any other mayor, mayor in America, uh, the role that preservation can play in revitalizing his city. In Denver, preservation is the driving force behind the effort that has pulled an area called Lower Downtown back from the brink of utter destruction and transformed it into a vibrant and highly desirable place to live and work. In Atlanta and Jackson, in low-income African-American neighborhoods, that have known decades of dis disinvestment and despair, preservation is the spark that is bringing new investment, new life, and new hope. The story is repeated in St. Louis and San Antonio, in Portland and Pittsburgh, in Milwaukee and Miami Beach. In city after city, the preservation and reuse of historic buildings and neighborhoods has become an engine that drives solid, sustainable economic revitalization. Nowhere is this more dramatically illustrated than in the National Trust's Main Street program. After helping to revitalize the downtowns of some 1,600 towns and small cities over the past 20 years, by, or by organizing the business community around a set of principles that include historic preservation, the Main Street program has moved into the neighborhood commercial districts of the nation's major cities. With strong leadership and support from Mayor Tom Menino, 
The program is revitalizing today 19 commercial districts in Boston. Mayor Martin O'Malley initiated a similar program in Baltimore last year, and Mayor Tony Williams has promised to start one in Washington soon. Every community needs a strong commercial center in order to thrive, and I'm convinced that every city in America could benefit from Main Street's preservation-based approach. <coughs> Don Ripkema, <coughs> who is the nationally recognized expert on this subject, put it this way, quote, I do not know of a single sustained success story in downtown revitalization anywhere in the United States where historic preservation was not a key component of the effort. That doesn't mean it isn't theoretically possible to have downtown re revitalization without historic preservation, but I don't know about it, I haven't read about it, I haven't seen it, end quote. Now how did this happen? What accounts for all this? Well, for one thing, America started to undergo a great national change of heart back in the 1960s and 1970s, which you recall were the heyday of urban renewal and the interstate highway construction. We lost thousands, of it, tens of thousands, of historic buildings and neighborhoods all over the country during those decades. But we gained something in the process. What we gained was a new attitude towards the past. We began to see our heritage as more than something to be put on display behind velvet ropes. We began to realize that we could use it, that we could, we could make our past a part, a living part of the present. And something else, perhaps even more important, we began to realize more strongly than ever before how much we needed the physical evidence of the past, needed it close at hand, where we could live with it, touch it, and learn from it. Having rethought our attitude towards our heritage, we created financial incentives for saving it. In 1976, for the first time, the federal government offered a tax credit for the rehabilitation of historic buildings. An expanded credit in the early 80s made historic rehab a very attractive investment opportunity and generated the biggest boom preservation has ever known. Now, the impact of this legislation has been largely ignored by government leaders trying to craft effective urban policy. That's surprising because that, imp that impact is so clearly visible right here in Washington. Union Station, a bustling intermodal transportation hub and one of the city's biggest of tourist attractions. The Willard Hotel, right across the street here, the Grand Dame of Pennsylvania Avenue. The Landsberg, a former department store that now houses depart downtown apartments and the Shakespeare Theater. These and many other DC landmarks were boarded up until the tax credit provided an incentive for developers to bring them back to life. Since the credit was enacted almost a century ago, a quarter century ago, more than 28,000 renovation projects have been completed, and nearly 300,000 housing units have been rehabbed or created, most of them affordable housing units, and many of them in downtown areas where they're critical to the creation of urban vitality. Now, here's the really impressive number. Altogether, tax credit rehab has leveraged private sector investment of more than $22 billion in the revitalization of America's communities. In addition to the federal credit, 20 states now offer a state tax credit as an extra incentive for rehabilitation. To cite just one example, North Carolina enacted a 20% credit in 1998. As a result, developers there last year spent $45 million rehabilitating historic buildings compared with just $6 million the year before the tax credits took effect. Rehab tax credit legislation has forged a mutually beneficial and enormously successful partnership between government and private sector businessmen. And right now, there's a crying need and a great opportunity for such a partnership in older residential neighborhoods. A couple of weeks ago, the mayor of Philadelphia announced plans to spend $140 million to demolish as many as 14,000 abandoned buildings in that city. There are an estimated 10,000 abandoned buildings in Detroit, nearly 40,000 vacant row houses in Baltimore, famous for its row houses, and thousands more in other cities, including Washington. Clearly, something needs to be done about these huge numbers of abandoned and deteriorated buildings. Demolition is an easy and dramatic way to approach the problem, but it's not always the best way. Not all of these buildings deserve to be saved, but many do. Wouldn't it be better to provide incentives that would encourage developers to rehab these buildings 
and provide critically needed affordable housing? Wouldn't it be better to hang on to these buildings as a means of maintaining and strengthening the neighborhood's character and satisfying our basic human need for tangible connections with our roots? I believe the answer to both questions is yes, and there's a good way to do it. For some time now, the National Trust has been leading an effort with our partners to secure passage of a piece of legislation called the Historic Homeownership Assistance Act. Building on the success of the commercial, uh, current commercial rehab credit, which I just mentioned, this legislation would provide a tax credit for the rehabilitation of owner-occupied residential historic property. It would offer an incentive for the reclamation of abandoned and deteriorated buildings. It would provide affordable owner-occupied housing. It would encourage people to stay in or move into older neighborhoods while preserving the historic character that gives those neighborhoods their very unique appeal. It would help cash-strapped local governments put properties back on the tax rolls. And perhaps most important, it would help build livable communities in areas that presently offer little or no incentive for reinvestment. The President's budget President Bush's budget includes a residential tax credit, which also claims aims at creating more affordable housing and promoting home ownership. This proposal and the Historic Homeownership Assistance Act complement each other very nicely. What we need is a tax credit that combines the best features of both. There is strong bipartisan support for the historic tax credit in both houses of Congress. The only issue is one of cost. It would cost about $1 billion over 10 years. Now that sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, but while we're looking to cut taxes by well over a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars over that same period of time, surely we can find a way to fit in a modest, very carefully targeted measure like this. Because if it's enacted, it will do more to revitalize the nation's older neighborhoods than any other single thing we could do. Even so, this one piece of federal legislation obviously won't fix everything. If we hope to truly create livable communities, li livable neighborhoods in our urban centers, we have to overcome some other formidable barriers at the state and local levels. For instance, it makes no sense to offer a tax incentive for rehab and then make the rehab process harder than it has to be. In fact, local building and zoning codes often make it difficult, much more difficult than need be, or even impossible for owners and developers to rehabilitate older buildings and bring new life to deteriorated neighborhoods. To replace these misguided regulations, we need so-called smart codes, which we're starting to hear about. Smart codes that encourage reinvestment. Some states have taken laudable steps in this direction. In New Jersey, for example, has enacted a statewide rehabilitation subcode, which is a set of rules for the renovation and reuse of older buildings that allows for the retention of historic character while still allowing modifications and, and ensuring safety. This new code has had a dramatic impact. Within a year of its adoption in 1997, rehab of older buildings jumped by 60 percent in Newark and by 80 percent in Jersey City. Now other states, including Maryland, are starting to follow suit. Also at the state and local levels, we need to support and strengthen the institution that is the strongest anchor of a truly livable community, and that, of course, is the neighborhood school. Thanks to inadequate maintenance budgets, misguided state education department policies, and consolidation of smaller facilities into some of these mega schools, these cherished icons, the neighborhood schools, are being abandoned and demolished at an alarming rate. We should be doing all we can to keep these schools alive, but instead, we're increasingly tossing them aside like yesterday's newspaper. With sensitive renovation and adequate maintenance, older schools can provide first-class learning facilities as well as, or even better than, huge impersonal new schools in locations accessible only by car and too remote to have any meaningful connection to the community where the student lives. Older neighborhoods need schools to attract and retain the middle-class residents whose presence is a key to sustaining livability and perhaps more important, to ensure that in-town kids have access to the equity and education to which they're entitled. If we want these neighborhoods to revive and flourish, we can't keep cutting the heart out of them. Now, I'm not so naive as to believe that preservation is the answer to all of our city's ills. There are plenty of urban problems, crime, unemployment, poor public services, 
that preservation alone cannot solve. Unfortunately, the critical need to find solutions to these problems is not being talked about today at the highest levels of government. In fact, there are no serious urban policy conversations anywhere today in official Washington. But circumstances have given us a unique window of opportunity to help our cities. If we miss it, we could lose ground. We could slip back. But now, with the momentum of, of urban recovery working in our favor, while a new generation of enlightened mayors, very result-oriented mayors, and savvy developers have come to the fore, while the nation's fiscal health is strong, now is the time, I believe, to launch a focused national effort to take the cities off of life support and move them into the recovery room. What we don't need are massive new urban programs like those that have had such mixed success in the past. Rather, I would like to see President Bush bring together a dozen of the nation's most creative mayors, and there are many creative mayors out there, a dozen of our most civic-minded corporate CEOs, and a dozen of our most effective nonprofit leaders, and challenge them to come up with five or six carefully targeted initiatives to stimulate more private investment in our cities. The public-private partnerships that are likely to emerge from these initiatives will offer just the kind of vision and energy that our cities need to tackle the challenge of creating more affordable housing, of improving the quality of public education, and of creating new jobs. This is the kind of thing that America does best. Identifying a problem, bringing together the best minds to study it, and coming up with a strategy for solving it. It's happened many times before. In fact, during the previous Bush administration, a high-level summit meeting pushed the issue of education to the top of the national agenda. And as a result, there is now broad bipartisan agreement on the need to focus the nation's energies and resources on improving our schools. And in fact, President Bush has doubled funding for liber proposed doubled, doubling funding for literacy, something for which he should be commended. We need the same kind of focus on mending the rest of America's tattered urban fabric. A report issued yesterday by a group called CEOs for Cities spotlights the powerful forces for positive change that are already at work in cities as diverse as Denver, Boston, Jacksonville, Richmond, Jacksonville. We need to learn lessons from the successes already being felt in these and other cities. We need to tap into the enormous energy and expertise available in the private sector and to recognize and emulate the groups and techniques that are already made difference. Forging effective private-public partnerships, <coughs> emphasizing the preservation and reuse of existing buildings, eliminating barriers and creating incentives for reinvestment. These are tools that work, and it doesn't take a genius to know that when you have a tool that does the job effectively and efficiently, you use it. If we're not smart enough to realize that, then maybe we deserve the suburban sprawl that we're getting that is soulless and increasingly traffic choked, farmland and open space that is fast disappearing, and urban centers that look like illustrations for a textbook of neglect and abandonment and failed initiatives. In a new book about urban design entitled The Seduction of Place, The City in the 21st Century, author Joseph Reichwert notes that, quote, irrationality and miscalculation sometimes ruinous miscalculation, are an inescapable part of the history of urban development. Those two terms, irrationality and ruinous miscalculation, offer a pretty accurate summary of the way Americans have treated our cities in the post-World War II era. But the fact that we've made tragic mistakes in the past doesn't mean we have to keep making them forever. We need to learn from those mistakes. We need to recognize that there are powerful forces, including market forces, that we can harness to accomplish the hopes and aspirations that we all share for our cities. It's a question of priorities and leadership. No great nation, including America, can survive, let alone thrive, without healthy urban centers. If we continue to allow the cities to rot at the core, the blight will spread outward, and it's already happening. Problems that were once confined to inner city areas are now plaguing the older inner ring suburbs. We can run, but we can't hide. Reclaiming the cities now, while we have the opportunity and the tools at hand, is the sensible thing to do. It's also the right thing to do, and I'm convinced, convinced that most Americans know that. 
They're simply waiting for the leadership to make it happen. Thank you very much. Don't go away. <laughs> this is kind of like old times. I get to ask you questions again. Um, you mentioned, you talked about the, uh, the private, uh, corporate, uh, uh, private enterprise and governmental uh, cooperation to help in the cities. Well, President Clinton, I think, had such a program called Enterprise Zones, and they were a number of cities incorporated those. Haven't they worked, or do they need to do more? Uh, they were very carefully targeted in, in some areas. Uh, I'm not as conversant on their success as I should be, but I think they have been effective in some ways, and they've, they've, been, go they've been targeted some of the hardest core poverty areas in the country. But it's, it's, it's kind of a classic government program uh, which seeks to work in partnership with local organizations. Uh, so I think we need that kind of effort, but I think we also need the kinds of private in incentives that I talked about in order to get more investment into these areas. You talked earlier in your speech that American cities are making a comeback. Um, you mentioned about Boston and Baltimore having their Main Street uh, programs. Can you give us some other examples of cities that you think are really making a comeback right now? Uh, it's a very mixed record. I think right at the top of the list is Chicago, uh, for some of the reasons that I mentioned. Chicago has a very dynamic, very effective mayor who understands preservation, understands the role it can play. And as a result, you have more loft conversions, you have more people living downtown by design. He's also worked very hard to make that city attractive. Chicago is one of those cities that actually gained population when everybody thought it would be a classic Rust Belt city that would lose population. It's had a heavy Hispanic uh, migration that has helped that, that growth. Uh, Denver is another example. Uh, for, the na for the last decade, Denver has had very enlightened leadership. Uh, currently, Wellington Webb, the mayor, uh, another outstanding mayor who understands what it takes to make a city work. Uh, there's an area in uh, Denver called Lower Downtown, Lodo to the locals, uh, that was the, uh, basically the warehouse district where, where uh, Denver was founded more than a century ago. Well, in the 80s, they were going to tear it down. Uh, but Federico Pena, who was then the mayor, and some local uh, private leaders got together, decided uh, they had a better idea, and they put a building, they put a demolition moratorium on lower downtown, put in place some incentives like the kind that we're talking about to get people to invest in them. Now, if you go to den downtown Denver, lower downtown, Lodo, is the most popular, vibrant uh, part of that city. It's a fabulous place, it's, and it's a mix of uses, and I think understanding how Mixed, use, mixed uses come together is very important in, the, in this effort. It's residential, it's commercial, it's entertainment, it's light industrial. It's so popular, this is where they put the new Rockies baseball stadium, not the other way around. Uh, people love restored historic districts. This is what gives downtowns vitality. And uh, downtowns are enormously important to the success of cities. Uh, they're not just the economic engines that drive these cities, but they're the social center. And they're in many ways, they're the heart and soul of cities. And that's why we put so much emphasis on downtown revitalization uh, as well as neighborhood revitalization. This question would like to know if, there, if you see that if there is any hope at all for cities such as Camden, New Jersey, Gary, Indiana, and East St. Louis. Well, those are the toughest toughest cases in the country. There's no question yes. about it. There's no question about it. But I believe there is hope for those cities. They're, they're going to they're gonna come along after some of the other cities. But what I think we increasingly have to do is look at the assets that these cities have. They have many assets. But among them uh, are the older structures that exist there. Uh, this offers enormous potential for rebirth. Uh, but as I said in my remarks, preservation alone can't solve these problems. They're, they're issues of crime, uh, unemployment, uh, poor public services, and bad schools that also have to be dealt with. But what we found is that if you can improve the living conditions in a neighborhood, if you can provide a more livable community, more livable neighborhood, a lot of these other issues are easier to solve. They're not automatically solved, but they're easier to solve. Because pe if people have respect for their community, they're going to have respect for each other. <coughs> 
and and a lot of a lot of things will flow from that. So yes, I think that you know I'm not prepared to give up on any city in America. I think they all have assets, and they all they all, there's reason to be hopeful about all of them. I think a lot of mayors would be saying, "Good, send the money." Um, the new census numbers show more growth in, in remote counties of our country, and this question wants to know if this is a sign that Americans are continuing to flee congestion, or are they creating more congestion by their simply moving? It's a complicated story, and we're just now beginning to understand what these new census numbers indicate. There are more people living in remote, in remote areas. Uh, and I think you, you can safely conclude that some, if not most of them, are fleeing congestion and, and, uh, and, and all the rest. But the, the most significant trends uh, of the latest census indicate that people are still moving out of cities, particularly the middle class is moving out of most, most northern cities. This is much less true when you get further south and into the west. We also have, as I mentioned, uh, uh, an influx of, my, of immigrants, particularly Hispanics, uh, to most of our cities. And, you know, to put this in perspective, uh, this is really the story of America, and I think it's a very positive story. Uh, the success that many cities are experiencing today is directly attributable uh, to these new migrants, immigrants. And, uh, and because they are filling up the vacant housing, they're filling the jobs that need to be filled, and they're bringing energy and, and real value uh, to these cities. The problem is that we have to staunch this exodus, I believe, of middle class people from our cities. And we have to attract more back. Now, I'm sure I'm going to get a question on gentrification, so I'll just address it right here. Uh, and it's a fair question, and it's something that interests a lot of people. <coughs> uh, Gentrification uh, has, has been an issue in the past, particularly in the 70s, when low-income people were displaced by other people coming back into historic district. The preservation movement learned a lot from that experience. And as a result, it's now our first goal to keep people in the neighborhoods and in the homes that, that they want to stay in. At the same time, there has been so much disinvestment from our core cities uh, in recent decades, that there is all this vacant housing, much of it historic housing. I mentioned the 40,000 uh, vacant row houses in Baltimore. We need to keep middle, more middle class families in the cities, and we need to attract more back. And the people, and there is now, happily, I think, a small trend in that direction in many cities. Uh, I was in Cleveland, Cincinnati, uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, other classic Rust Belt cities recently, and there, in every one of those instances, there is a migration back to the city on the part of, as you would understand, empty nesters or single people, because schools still tend to be a huge problem. Uh, public schools still tend to be a problem in most cities. <coughs> but that, but that <coughs> I think, is a, is a very positive thing. And the one thing that, that I think is adding to the revitalization of downtowns is the fact that a lot of people find downtown urban living a very attractive option again. And they hadn't for a long time. But now it is an option. We see, we see some of it here in Washington, not enough. Uh, but in places like Cleveland, you go down the Euclid Avenue corridor, uh, there, are, there are all kinds of uh, loft conversions underway and, and new apartments being created and more and more people living downtown. Cleveland is asking for gentrification because they have lost so much of their middle class in the last 20 or 30 years that it's a city of poor people. The average price of a house in Cleveland today is $60,000, which makes it very attractive for some people, and they have great neighborhoods. So it's a very complicated issue. There's good gentrification, there's bad gentrification. As I mentioned, the first goal should be to keep people where they, where they want to stay. But we also have to recognize that no city can survive without a strong middle class. Large uh, uh, retailers like uh, Walmart, Home Depot, and such like to locate on the suburbs because there's parking and more people get, can get to their locale. Uh, so how do you convince those kinds of retailers that there is, an, there is a good market in the city, that, but that it requires a different, uh, probably kind of a different building, a different uh, way of doing business? Well, uh, this is also a very interesting uh, phenomenon, uh, one that we've been very focused on at the National Trust. Uh, the development of the superstores, the, 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 the mega discount stores, has been a profound uh, factor in the, in the 
development of the suburbs. It, they will tell you that they follow the population of the suburbs, but they're also helping to bring the population to the suburbs. Uh, and they're doing it in ways that I think are destructive of community, that are uh, harmful to uh, aesthetics. Uh, they are, uh, I, I think, one of the most damaging forces uh, in, in, in America today in terms of what it's doing, doing to our economic and social fabric. Uh, we have strongly urged the discount stores to work with communities in terms of their size, their design, and their location. And one of the first things I did coming to the National Trust after we put Vermont, the entire state of Vermont, on our endangered list because it was the last state without a Walmart, uh, <laughs> no longer the case, that I went to uh, Bentonville, Arkansas to meet with the then CEO of, of Walmart to ask him to try to redesign a small 50,000 square foot store so that they could locate in downtowns and reinforce the, the business activity in downtowns. Well, they were very polite, but I, I was made to understand uh, that the economies of scale would not work, that uh, only a 200,000 square foot store uh, could work, uh, and therefore they were going to stick with their formula. Well, it, they were so eager to get into Vermont that they went into downtown Bennington and occupied an old Kmart store simply so that they, they could say that they were now in all 50 states. Well, I happened to be up there after they opened, and I went in to uh, ask for the manager, and I didn't identify myself, but I said, oh, now, how are you doing? This is a 50,000 square foot store. Can you, can you make it? And he was just proud as punch. He says, we have the highest sales per square foot of any Walmart store in the chain. <laughs> and, and, uh, and now, of course, their Walmart has, identi has identified this market uh, because all the other markets are saturated. What I think the basic point is that the nature of retailing is always changing in America. We've gone from department stores to shopping malls to discount stores to catalogs to the Internet, and it'll continue to change. A couple points. What the current trend is back towards traditional downtowns. People like downtowns. And, that's, and I, uh, I'm very pleased uh, that our Main Street program, which is focused on the revitalization of downtowns, is I think had something to do with that uh, in terms of making, providing models and formulas for making those downtowns work more effectively. But the basic point is that every community can be what it wants to be, can shape its own destiny. The problem is that some of these superstores come in with such enormous political and legal and financial resources that it overwhelms the capacity of the community to deal with it effectively. Now, that was true up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where these very small towns in some of the most beautiful and rich farmland in America were just overwhelmed. Uh, by Walmart and other retailers. If they're serious about being good corporate citizens, they should try to work with communities and not try to work against communities. They should try to determine what the community needs in terms of size and location and services. There's no question they're very good retailers. They're the best in the country. Uh, but they're not always the good corporate citizens that they should be. There is, of course, a lot of economics involved in this, and there's a couple questions that deal with that. And this one question says, um, how can you convince uh, people that we ought to save three- and four-story buildings when the land is zoned for 10 or 12 stories? Who will pay the property owner for not developing the site? Well, uh, I'm not sure I follow that, but I'll try. Uh, there are three- and four-story buildings that have served uh, that community well for some years and presumably can continue to serve the community well. Again, this is a matter of community choice and community determination, and that's really what, what formulates zoning codes. Uh, it should be within the ability of a community to determine that it wants to retain its older buildings that have character. Uh, uh, because if you take, if you take a... Uh, if you take a significant historic building out of a streetscape and put in something that's totally out of scale because it's ten stories high instead of three, three stories high, like the rest of the buildings, uh, you really destroy the, the streetscape and the character of that entire block, if not the entire downtown. Those are the kinds of things that communities should be able to determine for themselves. And unfortunately, uh, more and more communities are focused on this and what it takes to make a downtown work. So I think uh, I'm not troubled by that. Uh, uh, there, are, uh, there are a lot of 
people uh, who think that uh, every property ought to be realized for its fullest value, fullest economic value. Uh, that's, uh, that's important, but it's not the only factor that should go into these decisions. <laughs> we can all remember uh, the urban renewal programs of the past. And this questioner wants to know how we can ensure that communities of color are not negatively impacted by the positive steps toward rehabilitation. Well, that's a, that's a very good question. Urban renewal was the worst thing that ever happened to uh, urban America. It was well-intentioned. It was started here in the Truman administration, provided billions of dollars to cities to tear down their historic fabric. Uh, and this is why you see so many vacant lots in downtown still all over this country. Uh, because once you tear down a building with no specific concrete plan to replace it, the experience is that it will remain a parking lot for a generation at least. And, and that's what urban renewal did. And the reason why, and we've, we had some experience with that here in Washington, where all, virtually all of southwest Washington was destroyed in the name of urban renewal, putting something. Now, I wasn't here then, so I don't know exactly what southwest Washington looked like. It was not without its problems, but I gather it had great architectural character. And you go to Southwest Washington today, and you'll see a lot of things, but you won't see a lot of architectural character, uh, I think. Uh, but the question as to how we can be sure that African American and other minority neighborhoods are well served by the preservation activities that we try to bring to these cities is an important one, because they haven't always been well served. Uh, we have a program at the National Trust called Community Partners, part of which is our Inner City Ventures Fund. For, for 20 years, we have been trying to target inner city minority neighborhoods for this very purpose. So, and to help build community development corporations and other local organizations that can help determine on a community basis uh, what should happen. The key here is that every community has to decide for itself. You can't do this from the top down. At the National Trust, we can bring resources, we can bring technical help, we can bring guidance, but we can't bring determination. De the determination has to come from the community itself, and that's why in places like uh, Manchester, in the city of Pittsburgh, where uh, th this is a really a wonderful story, uh, of rich with, rich with history. There's a fellow there by the name of Stanley Lowe who wanted to improve his neighborhood. This is a neighborhood, of ver a very significant African-American neighborhood that had g dropped from 20,000 in population down to about 1,200 for all the usual disinvestment reasons. Well, he wanted to do something for his neighborhood. So he said, well, these people are leaving for the suburbs. Let's give them some suburban housing. So he started tearing down historic houses. And uh, uh, Arthur Ziegler, who then and still heads the Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation, said, no, there's a better way. You have assets in this community which can serve uh, this community for generations to come. So he put them on a bus, brought them to Washington, showed them Georgetown. And Stanley Lowe and his colleagues said, well, our houses are just like this. You know, we can do this. And it was an epiphany for him. As a result, Stanley Lowe, uh, who has been a trustee of the National Trust now for eight years, and next week will join us as a vice president for community revitalization, is the leading advocate and one of the leading uh, practitioners of using preservation as a tool for community revitalization. And that is really what preservation has become in America today. And that is what I think is its great future. It wasn't always relevant to, to many people in this country. We did great things, but the preservation movement was defined by the work of Anne Pamela Cunningham, who admirably rallied the nation 150 years ago to save Mount Vernon. That was preservation for a century. We still do that. But increasingly, it is using the tools and the experiences of preservation and the fabric that exists in virtually every community, uh, including many inner city uh, minority communities, to make for more livable communities. That's really what it's all about. I have a number of questions here that refer to the World War II memorial that's planned on the mall. Uh, they ask, uh, what do you think about it? Uh, one person called it an impending travesty, which I think indicates a point of view. Um, <laughs> but, but would like to know how, what you think about it, and uh, should we go forward with it? First of all, I believe strongly there should be a memorial to our veterans of World War II. I don't think anybody disagrees with that. And I think it should be a significant memorial, and I think it should be on the mall. 
where our most significant memorials are. But for four years now, four years ago this month, we first voiced our objections to both the siting and the design of the proposed World War II memorial. And others have done that uh, since. Uh, we think we had some effect on the design, but not enough. Uh, I would still prefer to see the World War II memorial uh, in another location, and I would prefer to see a much better design. I think it's a, it's a better design than was originally proposed, but it's an uninspired design, I think. So I think there's still work to be done. Uh, I, hope, uh, I hope we will see a better result uh, from this new process that's been set forth. Uh, just this week, uh, Congressman uh, John Lewis and J.C. Watts proposed uh, creating an um, African-American museum on the Mall. Uh, this question would like to know, do you think that uh, we've got too much sprawl on the Mall? Uh, two answers to that. Uh, John Lewis is, is the leading Democratic co-sponsor of the Historic Homeowner Tax Credit that I mentioned, and a wonderful friend of preservation because he knows what this can do in the Martin Luther King District of Atlanta, which he represents. Uh, I do think there's too much sprawl on the mall, but I don't think that that should impede the establishment of an African-American museum at the Smithsonian. As I understand, this would be in the Arts and Industry building at the Smithsonian, so it would not require new construction. I think that would be very appropriate uh, and, and long overdue. I do think that part of the problem with the mall is that additions of memorials have been ad hoc. Uh, some of this is inevitable. But, and, and I think it's important to understand when you're talking about the mall that the Macmillan plan of nearly a century ago always envisioned that there would be additions to the mall. It would not be a static thing. But there needs to be a, a much more carefully designed process for adding memorials to the mall. Uh, we have uh, advocated a moratorium on new uh, memorials to the mall beyond those that are already approved by Congress so that there can be a process established that will make for the orderly review and selection of new memorials. Uh, all it takes is an act of Congress uh, to, uh, to provide one of these. As you know, there is a, there is a law on the books which indicates that uh, one must be dead for 25 years before one can be memorialized on the mall. Well, there is legislation in the Congress that would basically vitiate that in the case of one or two individuals. Well, that, that shouldn't happen. But we are dealing with the Congress, uh, and, uh, and that's a reality. But I would hope that there would be a much uh, wider understanding of the need to do right by them all, which is you know, America's front yard. I mean, this is one of the most important pieces of space in the country, uh, rather than just doing these memorials uh, by ra at random. Well, how do you think President Bush is doing on historic preservation? A number of questioners want to know if, if you think that his budget uh, treats historic preservation uh, the way it ought to be treated? Well, it's mixed. Uh, we were disappointed that, the, that his proposals for funding of the Historic Preservation Fund were down from years before. Uh, particularly, uh, we're particularly concerned that funding for our state historic preservation offices is down. We think that needs to be not only restored but increased uh, because these individuals are doing more and more uh, work for tax credits, for all kinds of work in preservation. So we hope that that'll be restored. Uh, it's really too early to give a broad uh, judgment on that. We're very hopeful. Uh, we're especially hopeful uh, because Laura Bush is in the White House. We know her to be a good friend of preservation. She spoke at our conference in Fort Worth five years ago and was an eloquent spokeswoman for preservation. And she was an advocate of the Main Street program that I referred to early. So we, we're very hopeful that she will be a positive a force for preservation. I'm sure she will be. The president himself, I think, deserves great credit for leading the effort to help restore the 22 historic courthouses in Texas. Several years ago, we had these courthouses on our endangered list, and he led a, an effort through the Texas legislature to get funding to restore these courthouses. Uh, finally, uh, there is every reason to believe that uh, this administration is going to look kindly on the Save America's Treasures program, which was begun in a public-private partnership with the earlier administration. And uh, while nothing is final there, uh, we're very hopeful that they will want to support that program. So I'm encouraged. Before I ask the concluding question, I'd like to uh, uh, make you a couple of presentations. <laughs> 
One is a certificate of uh, appreciation for your appearance here today at the National Press Club. If I can keep it in the folder. Thank you. And a uh, coveted and uh, widely acclaimed National Press Club mug, <laughs> which is uh, used for any m number of things. Thank you. And um, as a last question, I'd like to ask you, um, going back to your days as a politician uh, for many, many years, tell us about life after politics. Uh, do, you, do you ever miss it when you, when you look, get up in the morning and see the campaigns going on? Do you say, gosh, I wish I was there? <laughs> Not recently. <laughs> no, I really don't miss it. There is life after politics, as I tell all my political friends who are here. There's life after everything, actually. We are so lucky to live in a time when you can go out and reinvent yourself a couple times during your lifetime, you know. Uh, that wasn't true in my parents' generation. People tended to do one thing for a lifetime. But isn't it so much more fun to go out and do different things? And I feel so fortunate to have, I, I enjoyed my time in politics and the White House and all the rest, and I wouldn't give up any of it for a minute. But I've never had a, as exhilarating an experience as I'm having at the National Trust. This is a wonderful organization, wonderful people, too many airplane rides, but everything else is great. Uh, and, and I think this is a movement that is really making a difference in America, community by community. And I think it has a great future, and I'm just very privileged and proud to be part of it. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dick. I'd, I'd like to thank Dick Moe for his presence here today. And I'd like to thank National Press Club staff members Melinda Cook, Pat Nelson, Joanne Booz, Melanie Abdel Dermott, and Howard Rothman for organizing today's luncheon. Also, thanks to the NPC Library for the research, and I'd like to thank all of you for being here. Thank you. <laughs> a distinguished career, began a distinguished career in public service with key staff positions in local and state government. He also chaired Minnesota's Democratic Farmer Labor Party while finding the time to earn his law degree from the University of Minnesota. Mr. Moe, now 64, is also an accomplished author. In 1993, he wrote a widely praised Civil War history of the famed 1st Minnesota Regiment called The Last Full Measure, The Life and Death of the 1st Minnesota Regiment. Historian James McGregor Burns, who was one of Mr. Moe's teachers at Williams College, compared the book to Tolstoy's War and Peace and Stephen Crane's The Red Badge of Courage. Mr. Moe is also the co-author of Changing Places, Rebuilding Community in the Age of Sprawl, a 1997 study of the causes of urban decline and the use of historic preservation as a tool to revitalize urban communities. As president of the National Trust, Mr. Moe is responsible for leading the largest nonprofit preservation organization in the United States. Chartered by Congress in 1949, the National Trust has more than a quarter million members nationwide, operates six regional offices, and has 20. Frank Alcofer, chairman of the club's speakers committee and a former president of the National Press Club. Speaking, skipping over our speaker for a moment, Al Isley, editor of The Hill, a former colleague of our speaker on Vice President Mondale's staff, and the committee, speakers committee member who organized today's luncheon. Thank you, Al. Linda Wheeler, The Washington Post. Kevin Diaz, Minneapolis Star Tribune. Ed Felker, Small Newspapers, Rochester, Minnesota, Post Bulletin. Michael Marlowe, Producer, White House Chronicles Television Program. And Gil Klein, Media General News Service and a former president of the National Press Club. As a lifelong student of American history, politics, and government, Richard Moe won his own place in the history books in 1984 when former Vice President Walter Mondale became the Democratic presidential nominee. Mr. Moe, who had been Mr. Mondale's administrative assistant in the Senate and his chief of staff in the White House, was asked by his former boss what he could do to defeat President Reagan. Well, Mr. President, Mr. Moe replied, and on Wednesday, May 16th, Edward Whitaker, chairman and CEO of SBC Communications Incorporated, will discuss full and fair competition 
in the broadband marketplace. If you have any questions for our speaker, please write them on the cards provided at your table and pass them up to me. But please make sure to write legibly or I'll never be able to ask the question. And I will ask as many as time permits. I'd now like to introduce our head table guests and ask them to stand briefly when their names are called. Please hold your applause until all head table guests are introduced. From your right and my left, John Cosgrove, communications consultant and senior past president of the National Press Club. John Edward Hurley, president of the Confederate Memorial Association. Steve Thoma of Knight Ritter Newspapers. Uh, Steve was awarded the Aldo Beckman Award by the White House Press Correspondents last Saturday for his coverage of the presidential campaign. Haya El Nasser, reporter, USA Today. Bill Hart, chairman of the board, National Trust for Historic Preservation. Julia Moe, the wife of our speaker. Frank Alkerford. <laughs> Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Richard Ryan, and I am senior Washington correspondent for the Detroit News and president of the National Press Club. I'd like to welcome club members and their guests in the audience today, and those of you who are watching on C-SPAN or listening to the program on national public television or radio. The video archive of today's luncheon is provided by Connect Live and is available through the National Press Club website at press.org. National Press Club luncheons are also carried live by many sites on the World Wide Web. Press Club members may also access transcripts of our luncheons at our website. And non-members may purchase transcripts, audio and videotapes by calling 1-888-343-1940. Before introducing our head table, I would like to remind our members of some upcoming speakers. On Friday, May 11th, William Gates Sr co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation will discuss his opposition to eliminating the state tax. And on Tuesday, May 15th, James P. Hoffa, general president of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, will discuss the state of his union. Why don't you call for a tax increase? <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> actually, actually, Mr. Moe can't really be blamed for that memorable and perhaps decisive moment at the Democratic National Convention. After President Carter and Vice President Mondale were prematurely retired by Ronald Reagan and the first George Bush in 1980, Mr. Moe returned to the practice of law. But he can be credited with helping Mr. Mondale win the vice presidential lottery as Jimmy Carter's running mate in 1976. He was the aide who advised Mr. Mondale to assure then Governor Carter that as a boy growing up in southern Minnesota, he ate grits for breakfast every day. <laughs> a mere five years after moving to Washington to join Mr. Mondale's staff as administrative assistant, Mr. Moe became chief of staff and the first member of a vice president's staff to also be a member of the senior White House staff. Mr. Moe practiced law in Washington from 1981 until January of 1993, when he became the seventh president of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. A native of Duluth, Minnesota, Mr. Moe graduated from Williams College in 1969 and soon became